Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Shashika Bandara, a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University. Uh, Tops is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, uh, Cheshang at the Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, so this seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and the discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Um, please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Uh, please keep questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Um, your questions are very, very much appreciated. Um, this presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. Uh, with that, I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Che Shang from the Ohio State University uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we continue our summer 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Jerome Ada entitled Health Beliefs and the Long Run Effects of Medical Information. Dr. Ada earned his PhD in economics at the University of Paris Sorbonne after studying biology at Agro Paris Tech and economics and the statistics at the ENICAE in Paris. He is a professor of economics at Bocconi and research director at the Rockwool Foundation Berlin. He was twice a managing editor for the Review of Economic Studies. His research interests include health economics, labor economics, and macroeconomics. His main contributions have been on the effect of public policies on health behaviors, the analysis of the spread of diseases, the links between income and health, the, the role of human capital on career choices and wage growth over the life cycle. Dr. Manuela Puenti, a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn, Germany, is a co-author of the study and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Dr. Ada, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you. Question is, so I need to share. Sorry. Take your time. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. I think this is fine here. Uh, yes, it looks good. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. <clears throat> so this is joint work with uh, Manuela, who is uh, present also in this uh, presentation. Uh, this is a work in progress, so uh, towards the end it's still a bit unfinished and uh, you know, I would be, would be very happy to, to have feedbacks and, and suggestions. I was asked to some disclosure here about funding. Uh, <clears throat> this is a cheap paper to produce because we essentially only using public uh, sources of data from the US, so we, I don't think we spend actually anything on this paper. Um, and I'm about to argue that scientific uh, information matters. If I were to say the opposite, uh, I would still have a job, I guess, at my university, but my job would probably be a bit less exciting. Okay, so let me take you back a bit. So I know this is a, a talk about tobacco, but uh, I want you to, to get back at least a century, 150 years ago, and uh, in, in medicine in general. So since the late 19th century, there's been tremendous progress in science and, and in particular medicine. And I'm thinking about, for instance, the hygiene revolution with people like uh, Louis Pasteur or Robert Koch, who discovered you know, how, how uh, communicable diseases uh, essentially uh, proliferated. What, so these, uh, these discoveries, or uh, you know, an intellectual endeavor is great for science, but in terms of uh, health uh, policy, it's not enough. You, know, you, you may discover great things or understand things, but to have an impact on population health, you need something else. And what you need essentially is that 
these discoveries have to be understood by the general population and they have to adopt them. So in the case of uh, Louis Pasteur, essentially was essentially washing hands, uh, so largely hygiene. But you know, uh, you have to make the population aware that this is why they do, we should do that and, you know, and make sure they actually wash hands. And this is true for many of uh, the discoveries later on. So essentially what we're going to ask in this paper is how successful is new information in changing perception and behavior in the long run. So there are several keywords in this uh, question here. One is information or medical information or more generally scientific information. The second one is perception. So how do we go from information to perception? And the third one is behavior. And the fourth one, probably, probably the long run part. So how does perception link to behavior is something we're going to try to understand. So the long run, uh, that's a hard thing to, uh, to tackle. What, you know, what we know in the short run though, is that some socioeconomic groups are rather difficult to reach. So not everyone received the information or not everyone necessarily read the, the newspapers or listen to the right uh, channels or, or are aware of science in general. Even if you receive that information, you may not understand it because you don't have the scientific background. Uh, you don't, may not understand the, uh, the, 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 the rationale behind those uh, messages. And even if you receive understand, you may not just trust medical information. Perhaps you don't trust uh, elderly white men in white coats for, for any understandable reason, perhaps. Uh, and so there is this problem in communication. So you may put out a scientific message, but then some groups would just not act on that. So that's the short run. Now, with time, this information, this scientific information may though reach some groups who are unreceptive in the first place. Maybe not directly, maybe through other groups, maybe because they bump into other people that tell them, oh, you know, I heard this and I think this is, this is right or this is what we should do. And so indirectly that may percolate through society. So there are many examples of this. One, which would be the, the, the object of the talk today is smoking. And if you consider this over a uh, century perspective, you know, the beliefs about tobacco went from well, probably positive at the end of the 19th century, beginning of 20th, to something which is now quite negative. But smoking is just one example. You can think of other cases, vaccination, for instance, if you take the MMR vaccine, and the scares that were there about a few decades ago, which led you know, some people to essentially mistrust that particular vaccine and, and uh, maybe others as well. And you know, not everyone react as uh, we expect them to do when we is our scientists. COVID is another example, of course. Now, this is broader than just health and medicine. Uh, you may think about climate change you know, how the beliefs you may have about the reality of the phenomenon and that may actually affect your personal engagement. Okay, so here again, we have scientists producing results and, and uh, uh, probing theories. And then we have also uh, individuals who have to make up their mind and, and act. Okay, so, so the methodology that uh, we have in this paper could be applied to many others. Uh, topics, not just smoking. So I know that you're interested in smoking and eager to hear about smoking. So we're going to that now. So of course, smoking is an interesting topic on its own. Uh, it's the leading cause of parental death in developed nations. It's cost of fortune to treat. And it's an interesting case to illustrate our theory here in the sense that you know, we have a lot of data on smoking. Um, uh, compared to other health behavior, it's been very documented. And there's also health information, which is quite, um, which, which one can time quite well. So essentially by 1950, we had the first scientific results received widespread attention 
um, Dahl and Hill, and then in the US, the 64, the Surgeon General Report on Smoking and Health. Okay, so we have like a half a century, more than half a century actually perspective on how behavior change, but also on perception. So although this information was out in the 50s, if you think about, uh, if you look at surveys about beliefs about smoking, in 1970, you had about a third of the US population who still did not believe that smoking could cause lung cancer. Okay. Uh, so that's almost two decades since the, the first scientific papers were published, at least. By 2020, of course, that information had spread and about a good 90% of people in the US think that smoking can cause lung cancer, but there's still large disparities by education, race, age, or region that I will document uh, soon. So you can see that it takes quite some time to spread, but in the end, that information seems to essentially reach most part of society, uh, perhaps with some exception. So what are the contributions of, of our paper? Well, the first part was essentially uh, a data contribution. Uh, so it came a bit of a surprise to the economist that I am. There is extensive evidence on beliefs about smoking uh, because other uh, fields have actually got an interest in that, in sociology, in epidemiology, and so on. And so there is actually a range of, of data sets uh, some cross-sectional, some uh, panel data, some more aggregate that actually record the beliefs of people about smoking over time. And there's also a fair amount of heterogeneity. You can look at different groups. So we essentially have gathered a lot of this evidence uh, to use in the analysis. So the other contribution here is we're not really interested in the short run. I mean, it is an interesting point, but uh, we want to look at the very long run perspective well over a century. What we're going to do for that, because it's complicated to estimate or to analyze long run uh, phenomenon. So we need a bit of structure and a model being a economist. Uh, and what we develop here is a, is a dynastic life cycle model of competing mortality, risk, risk perception, uh, information propagation, and in the end smoking. So we have here different elements, which are the beliefs or the risk perception, how information flows, and uh, people acting, which is smoking or not. So this paper is really geared towards the sources of learning, and we have several of them to make the, the, the analysis interesting. The first one is simply introspection. So you learn from your own experience. Right, so you may smoke and then experience uh, particular diseases or discomfort, or, or you see people just around you that suffers from strokes or, or cancer and so on. Okay. So for, for many products you know, beyond smoking, that's a powerful tool to, to learn as for, for humans as species. Okay. Um, we didn't need medical uh, research to um, to figure out that some mushrooms were actually lethal. Okay. Uh, presumably in the Stone Age or even before, you know, we had a neighbor who was eating one of them and we saw that that person dying or, or heavy, heavily sick. And that was, you know, people got it pretty quickly. Okay. So that could be, uh, so it remains to be seen that this is a case for smoking, but it could be one source of, of learning. Okay. Now, I was alluding to the human species, we are a social species. And so there's a lot of social learning that goes on. You know, we share stories, we share experiences, uh, and that could be one way to propagate information or disinformation in some cases. The third channel is essentially what we do here in terms of scientific debate, public health information, uh, there are scientists that work on these topics and make conclusion and then disseminate that to the public. Okay. So we need to allow for these three channels to influence uh, people's belief about smoking. 
So what we do, and I'm not going to be very formal in this talk, the, there will be a paper later on uh, when we finish that, which will be much more uh, precise in terms of modeling, but we show that such model can rationalize many aspects of the data. And having a model, we can then evaluate the importance of medical information because we can essentially simulate a counterfactual world where we eradicate scientists. Not that this would be a great world, but you know, to see what could have happened if we hadn't been there. So the plan here, I am going to start with data. So to present you some evidence on smoking and beliefs, uh, then about the model in a succinct way, and we'll talk about the results and, and policy implications. So this is very small font. Uh, so the point here is not really to, uh, to point you to each and every data set that we've been using. It's more to impress on, on you that we actually use a lot of data. Hopefully, for these slides, uh, the data, as I said, are actually quite uh, common. You know, so NHIS, NHANES, uh, there's the, the HRS, the Health and Retirement Survey, and essentially a particular number of data that pertains to, to beliefs. Okay, that some of you may uh, know of. Okay, so I'll show you some descriptive statistics coming from some of these data sets. Now, I just want to start with medical information because this is the heart of the paper. And so if you can see this graph, essentially it's very hump-shaped. It has uh, an index between zero and one uh, on the uh, y-axis and on the horizontal axis, you have time years, 1940 to 2020. Uh, and this is essentially how much has been published either in scientific publication or in newspapers uh, about smoking and the harm of smoking. Okay? So pre-1940, there was not much going on. There were a few papers, but they're very, very descriptive and uh, a bit uh, speculative on why smoking seemed to be uh, dangerous. The first really hard evidence was with the pioneering work of Dahl and Hill that essentially gathered data on the court of, of British doctors um, about their smoking habits and they started following uh, this individual over time and very quickly they realized that there was something uh, dramatic going on and that the, the smokers in that court were sick and dying at a much higher rate. And that started a series of publication uh, of these two authors that were very influential. And following that, there was a peak in publication around 1960 that was sustained essentially into the 80s, and then a relative decline uh, as uh, the medical profession essentially turned to other diseases and other uh, issues. As you can see, the newspapers started to report on that a bit, uh, but a bit with a lack. Okay, so there was uh, the peak of, of the publishing year was essentially in the bit before 2000, in the 90s, and then also started to decrease. So just to have that in mind, so essentially we will start very early on in the 20th century at a time where there was not no public uh, or, or scientific evidence and midway through in the 50s or so, suddenly the public is confronted with that evidence. And the question is, how do different socioeconomic groups react to, to that uh, shock? So smoking, I assume you're very familiar with that. Uh, whether you look at the per capita consumption of cigarettes uh, on the left here, uh, starting from 1900 to the 2000s, it's a hump shape uh, profile. Very few people were smoking in the early part of the 20th century, mostly affluent people in that time could afford that. And then pro progressively, it's kind of democratized, reaching a peak in the uh, 50s and early 60s, and then declining after that. Okay. Um, if I go, so obviously, the, the, the peak here was more or less uh, when the information about the danger of smoking was, re was released. Okay. Not all socioeconomic group actually uh, react in the same way. In the paper, we distinguish between education groups and racial groups. 
Uh, and you can show that, for instance, white educated individuals, especially on the, the coast in the US, uh, seems to be reacting faster to that news. The peak is, is earlier than for other groups, for instance. Uh, but because the, the date on smoking is presumably well known, let me move to the beliefs, um, which is probably a bit less uh, known, at least to, to the economics profession. So this is coming from the, the Gallup poll, which uh, surveyed individuals in the US for a long time with two types of questions, is smoking harmful or does smoking cause lung cancer? So there are many interesting parts on this graph. Um, so obviously you can see that around the time where the first scientific evidence were coming out, um, you had a change in, in the beliefs of people. Okay, so it is steeply increasing around the 50s and 60s, 70s, um, and then reaching not quite 100%, but not close to that. The second interesting part is that by 1950, if you look at the question is smoking harmful, well, you know, by and large, you had more than half of the population who actually was willing to say that yes, it's dangerous. Okay. So either they were super informed uh, and were reading the British Journal of uh, New England Journal of Medicine or the, the BMJ, uh, or they figured out somehow from other sources and perhaps from their own experience. So perhaps, you know, introspection is not such a bad uh, tool and maybe uh, social learning is not such a bad tool neither, essentially to, to gain knowledge uh, in the society. Okay. Uh, so having said that, you know, the, the progression here in terms of the change in beliefs over time, you know, scientists probably had a large role in, in that and that's essentially the point of our paper. The other interesting part in this graph is what's happening in the 90s. Essentially, you know, the proportion of people who believe in that smoking is dangerous kind of stalled at that point uh, around the 1990. So of course, you know, you can't go beyond 100%. So you have to plateau at some, some place. But we'll come back to that graph later. Uh, there was something essentially happening in the 90s and 2000. You know, it's even like slightly declined in some cases here in the beliefs. And we'll come back to that later on. So I'm going to show you a bit of heterogeneity. We start with young adults, uh, 18 to, to 30. So this is coming from Monitoring the Future, another source of data between the 80s and 2020. And as you can see here, the solid black line or blue line here at the bottom, these are the youngest, the 18 year olds. So they start much lower in terms of beliefs and the general population. Uh, which by that time essentially reached close to 90%. So the young are seems to be less informed or less convinced that uh, smoking is dangerous. Nonetheless, there's a steady increase over time. So uh, an 18 year old in 2020 is not the uh, same as an eight year old in 1980. Okay. And you can see that the, for the other lines here for the 19 to 22, the 23 to 26, et cetera, they're atop of each other. Essentially it looks like there's a learning over the life cycle and learning uh, over time. Right, so this is an aspect which is interesting uh, given that those who essentially initiate smoking are, are young people. If I look at the heterogeneity by education or race, education being the one on the left here, you can see that there's an education gap. Low educated individuals are less likely to, to believe that smoking is dangerous. There's about 10 percentage gap, which is quite substantial. Uh, and that hasn't closed over the period uh, 1985 to 2020. Okay. On the right, you have the uh, racial gap with the, the whites being those who are more likely to think that smoking is dangerous, the blacks being the, the least here and you know, between five and six, seven percentage uh, gap, which is also not, I mean, not closing that much. Okay. And in general, you can see that these series are not increasing in this kind of hump shaped, but uh, 1985 looks rather similar to 2020 in many respects. Now, there's also panel data, and this is a data set called PATH, 
And the uh, great advantage of that is that you can survey and you can get information, uh, repeated information around the same individuals. So it's a fairly large uh, data set, about 37,000 individuals. Uh, there's at least five ways. I think there's a new wave out. And uh, you're there every two years, people are surveyed and you can see whether they change their views or not. If you just look at the, the raw data, if you want, from one year to another, there's a lot of inertia. About 60% of the population does not change their beliefs over a period of two years. And about the same amount of people see a decline in their beliefs, and some of them see an increase in their beliefs. Okay, So you could see that there are both a phenomenon going on. Some people seem to be more convinced, and some people seem to be less convinced. Now, of course, this is just raw data. I mean, people could tick boxes at random. And so that's what you would see if people were just ticking boxes approximately. Uh, so you can be a bit more uh, precise and exploit the fact that we have information for five different periods, which is, uh, oh, no, I don't have it here, uh, which is actually to take out a bit the noise. Uh, so people who say well, that they think it's very dangerous and then it's not dangerous at all and then dangerous again. So you look at the trend and essentially um, you get the same uh, information here about two thirds of the sample are not changing their beliefs and the rest equal amount are either think it's more dangerous or less dangerous. Okay. So it seems to be a phenomenon that is survive at least this, uh, this uh, modeling. So essentially, if we want to model this phenomenon, we have to accept that some people get convinced and some people get convinced about the opposite. So let me just take you through essentially this story um, through the advertisement of the tobacco company. It's, uh, so it's my, my own or our own uh, choices of adverts, but it's quite telling. Uh, so the first one, top 1885, um, is uh, so one of the earliest uh, uh, ads. So they all come from the, the collection at Stanford, which is a great place for those. Um, so the first one, you see a bunch of rather affluent people, actually men and women at the time. Uh, it's the women who, who was uh, about to smoke. And uh, you know it says this is an absolute cure, a cure for catar, cold in the head, whatever that means, asthma, hay fever, et cetera. Okay. So here it's viewed as something presumably positive, uh, prescribed by doctors as well. Uh, so more of a medicine than something detrimental to your health. If we fast forward to 1942, we have this one here, are cigarette claims true or false? Aha. So is it that the, you know, the cigarette industry is having doubts about the product? And if you read the fine print there, it's not exactly that. It's actually about um, whether in, uh, cigarettes, you know, are, are, are a mild or not, and uh, so they advertise for something for mild cigarettes. Okay, 1951. Now the first papers have been published. Okay, so now the uh, the industry, tobacco industry is trying to respond to to the scientific debate here. This is Believe in Yourself, a campaign by Philip Morris, which is actually targeted to, to us doctors. And essentially what that uh, ad is saying is, well, you know, don't listen to what other people are telling you. Just light the cigarettes, inhale, and think for yourself. Yeah, believe in yourself. And this, we'll come back to that later on, it is actually a very powerful message. So ignore, you know, other information, ignore scientists, ignore whatever, what your, your family or, or friends are saying, you know, just get into your introspection world and, and, uh, and live there. 93, you know, things have dramatically changed because by that time, essentially 90%, at least of the population think this is dangerous. And the uh, tobacco uh, company has given up hope of convincing people that it's actually uh, um, it's, uh, not a dangerous product. So essentially, it's about style. Now it's actually women, a uh, key uh, target for the advertisement here. It's, uh, you know, keep it cool, keep it uh, stylish. 
So essentially, you can see that through these uh, this ad, this, the story has changed uh, in quite an interesting way. Talking about the tobacco industry, you know, um, this is uh, data on how much lobbying and advertisement they were making. Um, you know, before 1940 was not much. Uh, they essentially increased advertisement as uh, scientific information came out. And when they could essentially advertise their product, they turn their money to lobbying. Yeah, so this is an important player. Uh, we can't ignore the effect of the tobacco industry on the perception of people. And we're going to model that explicitly. So this is a quick panorama of the data and a bit of the history of, of this. Uh, there's more, there will be more in the paper. What I will try to do now is to try to rationalize uh, what we've seen, uh, essentially in terms of behavior, in terms of beliefs. Uh, and for that, I need a bit of, uh, of theory. Uh, I'm not going to show you a lot of equations. I've tried to take them out. Uh, the paper is more precise. So essentially, we're going to have many individuals followed from birth to death. Why is that? Well, partly because we've seen that there's a life cycle aspect to smoking for sure, and also in terms of uh, beliefs and perception about the dangerousness of tobacco. Uh, partly also because one dramatic event in terms of tobacco is essentially is death. Okay, so we learn from causes of death, uh, and that's essentially how Dolan and Hill uh, learn also about the effect of tobacco. We're going to populate the world with many overlapping cohorts uh, in a dynastic model. So dynastic being uh, you have children and parents. And we're going to have here our first cohort born around 1885. And we're going to assume that a new court is born about every 25 years. Okay, so there is going to be a successive generation that will uh, live and, and die. So you have many generations or several generations in a given year. So you have uh, children, parents, grandparents, maybe even great grandparents. Uh, and we're going to abstract from gender in this, uh, in this model. So essentially, reproduction is to parthenogenesis. So each individual produces one offspring with the same characteristics. Those characteristics are essentially an education level, race, and a geographical location. So here we assume that people are not moving uh, around. They stay in their region. Um, and so, so to simplify things. So we would have many cohorts. We have a group here, I, I call it GI, but that's not really important. Uh, and all these individuals will have to decide in every period whether they should smoke or not. Okay. So that's the decision that these individuals do two things. Uh, in the left, they, they decide whether to smoke or not, and then they gather information and, and update their beliefs. So this decision to smoke depends on essentially many factors, some of them being individual uh, specific and other societal factors, which I'll be more precise. Well, it will depend on past behavior because tobacco is addictive. Okay? So if you've been smoking before, uh, the choice of continuing smoking is going to be increased. There will also be peer effects or, or a simplified version of that. So if there are more people around myself who are smoking, I may be more likely to smoke myself. There's going to be a health status. So in this small people can be in good or bad health. And individuals in bad health may not find smoking uh, maybe pleasurable or, or, or useful. Um, of course, we're going to have beliefs about how dangerous tobacco is. And because uh, we're interested in policy as well, uh, and you know, prices have changed quite a lot over the century, so we will have prices here. So in this model, you know, beliefs are important, but it's just one of many determinants of why people are smoking or not. And so this individual makes their these decisions. 
their beliefs will be heterogeneous. So not everyone uh, is alike. So they, they will have uh, that disagree in terms of their beliefs. And that will evolve uh, as they learn over the life cycle. And the different cohorts will essentially have different beliefs as well. As I said, uh, well, I didn't say that, but the initial beliefs will be passed on by the parent. Okay, so there's some, uh, some inertia for that, so some linkage across generation. And then there's going to be updating of beliefs through the three uh, channels I've, uh, stuff I've already alluded to, introspection, exchange of information among friends, and then medical information or tobacco firm obfuscation. So the model is quite complex. So I tried to simplify it a bit. This is one piece of that model where you would see you have individual beliefs that leads to individual behavior. So that's the, the core of the model. And these individual beliefs here come from introspection, communication between yourself and friends. So your friends influences you and vice versa. And then you may have you know, post-1950 or so, medical information that may hit yourself or your friends, okay? So these arrows here are important for, because a given individual here may place very little weight on, on, on doctors or scientists. So maybe for some individuals, this link here will be very tiny or even inexistent. That doesn't mean that medical information is not useful to that individual because that medical information would hit friends or maybe friends of friends, and then surely but uh, slowly come back to this individual. So you may trust more your friends than your doctor. And so then the information spreads through indirect way and reach you through very indirect ways. So of course this model is a bit simplistic. So there are more things to uh, to, this, uh, to the individual behavior, as I was alluding to, you know, that PFX, so if there are more people smoking around you, you may be more induced to smoke. There are cigarette prices and other policies that uh, influence behavior. And one thing which is important here, considering that we consider the whole of the 20th century, there's the future consequences of smoking. So you could have two individuals with the same prices and same peer group and same beliefs, but they may make different decisions here. So if you're essentially low educated, a minority, uh, a bit uh, middle aged in the, in the year 1901, um, you know, the future consequences of smoking may not have been very high on your agenda. You were much more likely to die of the Spanish flu, of other communicable diseases on your, uh, on your job or through accidents or if you're a very you know, uh, wealthy or, or even better, you know, a university professor, uh, nowadays smoking uh, will have dire consequences. You know, we could have a very long life expectancy, but if we, if we smoke, we may well die <coughs> by a, a stroke at age 60 or, or 70. So that would be a lot of years lost, okay? So the trade-offs for individuals, even if they understand uh, the dangerousness of, of tobacco, you know, they may uh, differ though by the, how much more you're going to live. And so there's an important part here, which has to do with competing risk, so if you, if you think you're going to die from, what kind of cause are you going to die from? And which has dramatically evolved uh, uh, over the 20th century. So I'll come back to that later on. If I close down the mold, mold here, what we have here now, I have a tobacco related health, which is influenced by your own smoking. I have some non-tobacco related health. Think of uh, Spanish flu or or any other disease here, uh, you know, and the two of them will essentially feed into the future consequences of smoking and your tobacco related health essentially throws back here where we started with the introspection. Okay, so you, you try smoking, you experience uh, 
the uh, potential effect of smoking, and then you may essentially update your beliefs. And that leads you to change your behavior, perhaps. Excuse me, Dr. Ada. Sorry for interrupting, but we only have 20 minutes left. Or... Yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm used to that. Um, I have more slides than what I want to say. Okay, so this is essentially the, uh, the, uh, the model. Uh, so it's a dynamic model, perhaps. I'm going to skip preferences uh, because here people make choices. Uh, so tobacco is, is consumption good. Um, so this is quite standard for economic models to have preferences. I already said a lot about that. Um, one thing though is, uh, so consumption or finance here by an income, uh, that varies of course across age, court and socioeconomic groups. So this is actually something important in the sense that you know, tobacco is expensive. And in the very uh, early part of the 20th century, not everyone could essentially afford smoking. So essentially smoking was more in, in the privileged group, which means that this group was essentially, could actually experience themselves the effect of tobacco. Uh, other groups, uh, maybe low educated uh, minorities, etc., they, you know, they, they just couldn't uh, actually uh, experience that. So, so the tobacco was not at the very beginning of the 20th century, not something that they were practicing or, or consuming. So in terms of information about beliefs, et cetera, you may think that essentially it's some groups that were actually smoking early on may have had themselves more insights into how dangerous that was, okay? or they had a chance at least to, to learn that. Okay. So in this world here, there's going to be a, a true effect of smoking. So the probability of getting a smoking related health shock, think of lung cancer, will depend on, to simplify on age, on how much you've been smoking and demographics. In this model here, the individuals are going to hesitate between two states of the world. One in which smoking is truly harmful, which case the property of getting your disease depend on age, demographic and smoking. And another world which, where smoking is not harmful, and so the disease here, say lung cancer, depends on age, demographics, but not smoking. So there's no connection between your action and the probability of the disease. Okay? And these individuals don't know. Uh, they are born in this world and they're trying to find out which is the true state of the world. I'm, so I have very few notations here, but I'm going to uh, call the load odds ratio, which is the, the ratio of the probability of being in the harmful and non-harmful world taking the log of that. So uh, that log odds ratio is going to simplify the notation later on. Um, so that's essentially how much, it's a proxy for your beliefs or a measure of your beliefs about smoking, okay? And for the point of the individual in this model here, if you have a log odds ratio of lambda, essentially your evaluation of your probability of catching lung cancer will depend on how likely you think we are living in a harmful world versus the non-harmful world. And so it's going to be uh, a mixture of the probability of the harmful world and the non-harmful world. Mortality, as I said, is a competing risk framework. In this case, we have two causes of mortality, one which is potentially related to tobacco and one which is not related. Uh, and death occurs if you, know, you can die of either of them or both at the same time. Okay. What's on this graph here is essentially the, the death rate of uh, 55, 64 year olds uh, of 1900 to, to today. You can see that essentially has been you know, a great increase in life expectancy. Uh, but you can see also that at the beginning of that century here, the, the, the other races, the non-whites here had a much higher uh, rate of, of uh, mortality. Okay? They were not smoking neither at the time. And so for them, the trade-off was very different than it was for the whites and even more than it is today. I'm going to skip uh, this graph here. So these individuals will have a dynamic choice here where they decide to smoke in each period. They're going to balance the current utility of smoking with future consequences 
and that depends on beliefs, uh, on their mortality rates, addiction, so on. And formally, this is going to be a Bellman equation that we are solving. Um, right, so there's three channels in this model. One, as I already said, is introspection. So introspection, you see if you get the disease or not, say lung cancer, and then you update your beliefs. At the same time, if you don't get the, the lung cancer or, or tobacco-related disease, you also learn from that. And so essentially the, your change in beliefs here or in the log odds ratio will be depending on whether you experience the onset of the disease. So the way this is going on is that early on, well, nobody really gets lung cancer, so there's not much information. But uh, as uh, time progresses, you know, some people still not uh, sick, and for certain, when it's kind of so far so good, and they start perhaps revising that this may not be such a dangerous world in the end, or at least for them. And once they essentially experience the disease, then they revise their opinion uh, upwards uh, dramatically. Okay, so just with that mechanism, essentially there would be a slight general decrease in beliefs as people are aging, and then suddenly an increase when they experience uh, diseases. We also have information, so external information, where scientific publication, so after 1950, essentially we're going to assume that scientific publication is going to sway at least some people into believing that smoking is dangerous. Not every group would trust scientists, and the degree to which they trust scientists is something we, that we uh, estimate. Okay, so typically, you no know, high educated individual would put more weight on scientific publication than low educated individuals, for instance. Okay, and then they incorporate that information into their beliefs. So their beliefs today is the beliefs uh, from yesterday, plus the medical information and the tobacco obfuscation. Okay, conversely, the tobacco industry here is trying to persuade people that it's not dangerous. Now, social learning, this is the hard part of the model. So we're going to assume a certain degree of naivety of these individuals. This is the degree of agents. And so here, individuals are going to belong to a network of friends and relatives, you know, the, well, the set F, and they meet every year and they discuss their beliefs and they revise their beliefs. Okay? And the way this is done is, well, uh, we're going to assume a certain degree of homophily essentially based on the general social survey here, say low educated are more likely to mix with low educated individuals, whites with whites, blacks essentially is a bit more mixed. Uh, so if this is a group of people who essentially maybe have a, a distrust for, for historical reason of the medical profession, they're also more likely to uh, meet people who actually trust more the uh, medical information. Okay, so that's all a channel of uh, propagation in society. Okay, so when two people meet, what are they talking about? So one view is, uh, so I'm Mr. A here, I have low beliefs in how dangerous tobacco is, and I meet uh, person B here is very convinced. And at the end of that meeting, we go out of that room and we kind of persuade each other and we kind of meet somewhere in the middle or not, or not quite. Okay. So that's one way of communicating, which we have in the mall. The other way is a bit more sophisticated, where we convince, uh, we try to, to uh, average or, or, or uh, communicate not really the level of information beliefs that we have, but how it changed over two periods. So if I don't, didn't experience a revision in my beliefs, but this BP person here got more convinced, I may essentially learn from that and change my beliefs. So it's increasing here and I have nothing to report to B, so B stays where it is. Okay, so this is a different form of, of uh, communication, which is new information averaging. And it turns out in the estimation, this is uh, much more likely uh, the way uh, people communicate. Okay, so if we put everything together, so we've got a complicated equation, but essentially we have many sources of learning and beliefs evolves here through social learning, introspection, and, and, uh, and external information. I think I'm going to uh, stop 
here to take some questions. Um, I think we don't have enough time. We'll save all the discussions to the top of the tops at the end. Oh, okay, sorry for that. <laughs> so please, thank you, missionaries. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sorry. Um, okay. So this model is estimated. I'm not going to dwell on how this is done. Um, we use a lot of information coming from the, the data I've shown you later on, uh, before at the beginning of the presentation. Okay. If I show you simulation of the model to get a sense of what's going on, uh, so you have the observed and the predicted. The predicted is the blue line here. We here have uh, the beliefs over time, that uh, essentially the Gallup poll on tobacco. Okay, so we capture this increase in beliefs over time and also the, the slowing down in the 90s. Okay, we can match other dimensions of beliefs, uh, not just whether your belief is dangerous or not, but also if it's grades, moderates, like honoris or graduation of, uh, of how of your beliefs. We can also match to some extent the variance here of the intra group variance in beliefs. Um, which has been pretty flat over that time, uh, which is an interesting uh, phenomena uh, by different groups of individuals, smokers, non-smokers, and racial groups. Uh, we can do a really good job at matching mortality uh, rates, uh, the smoking attributable mortality, so cause of death as well, by age and years, etc. We can also match well the cancer rates here, so tobacco-related health over age and different cohorts and different uh, uh, characteristics. So overall, the model is uh, predicting, this is smoking as well, uh, smoking initiation and, and uh, uh, current smoking. And I'm going to skip some of this dimension where many parameters, I'm not going to go uh, through them. I'm going to show you a simulation. Just a, a small detour, you know, it's not that you, because, uh, um, beliefs drives uh, the probability of smoking, so behaviors, but that's not the only factor that drives that. So in this small here, those who think it's very dangerous or totally convinced it's dangerous are much less likely to smoke, okay? But it's not a zero one decision here. So for the last two or three minutes, I'll show you policy count factors. So this is the whole model I have. Now in 1950 onwards, I'm just going to shut down the medical information and see what happens. Okay, and this is a way to evaluate the long-term effect of scientific information. I show you this uh, thing. I also show you what happens when I shut down a tobacco advertisement. Essentially, if we shut down medical information up to the 50s, essentially we have the same evolution of beliefs. Okay, the blue line is what we uh, estimate. So this is uh, close to, to the truth or what we observe in the data. And the red one is the counterfactual where no medical information is present. Okay, so this has been increasing over time. People learn, you know, without scientists, but it's just very, very slow. It would take about a century to essentially reach the point where we are today. Okay, so that's the main point of the paper. Medical information in the long run is a key factor in changing the beliefs of people. Now, if we shut down the tobacco industry, you would see that essentially we would have converged to 100% more or less uh, by the 90s or so. So part of the, how the all interpret this data is that the plateauing in the 90s essentially is partly coming from the effort of the tobacco industry. So the tobacco industry is essentially suppressing the number of people who believe that smoking is dangerous. Okay? So they have a big role in this history as well. Now, believe in yourself. So this is a world where we're shutting down not only uh, the medical profession, but also any advice you may get from your, your friends. Okay, so this is really you smoke and you wait to get lung cancer or not, and you pass that on to your child. Okay, that would take about six centuries uh, to reach the today's level. So there is slight learning over time, but it takes forever. Okay. So essentially, when the tobacco industry came out with this uh, slogan, that was, was actually a very, very powerful one. It's very, they knew what they were doing. 
Now we can also simulate other things about uh, beliefs, about prevalence, about uh, cancers, etc. So essentially, you know, fewer people believing it's dangerous is going to lead to more smoking and to more cancers. We can quantify that as well. I'm going to finish here. It's actually the first paper to look at the evolution of beliefs uh, over an extended period, and which endogenizing beliefs and health behavior here. Uh, and we have like a long run perspective on the focus of the role of heterogeneity across group. So this is a bit of a macro paper, essentially meeting sociology, if you want, uh, with different socioeconomic groups and how that evolves over a longer run, okay? Um, yeah, so medical information is slow, you know, to, to reach everyone in society at first, but it's substantial in the long run. And I think that's the message of the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ada. Uh, I see that Mamala is answering the questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so I think we have time for some discussion, uh, maybe one high level questions. Uh, our discussion today is Dr. Michael Darden, Associate Professor from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so Michael, do you have uh, one uh, high level questions to ask? Thank you. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I, um, <clears throat> I have a long, long list of questions. Uh, about some of the technical aspects of the paper, and I'll, I'll skip all of those. <clears throat> Just to say that in addition to all of the extraordinary data work, I mean, this was a, an enormous lift with respect to data and teaching us about these data sources. I work in this field and I was unaware of some of these sources of data. So I, I, I thank you for that. Um, you know, I think this paper does an, an amazing job of, of providing us a framework to think about the competing sources of information that the public experiences and thinking about how those competing uh, sources of information uh, affect behavior. So, um, you know, I, I think this is very valuable. This audience, I think, is more concerned with things like tobacco control policies. Uh, and what we're seeing here is that beliefs are really important as well. And they've evolved in, in very interesting ways. Um, I guess I, my, a, a high level question for you Dr. Ada, is just to think about the accuracy of the information that comes out. So to what extent do you think when new information arises that may not be fully correct or, or maybe just noisy, that that noise plays a role? And maybe that's part of your model that that was, you know, in the in the in the inner workings of your model that you didn't didn't show. But does the noise of the information and and the frequency of the information matter? So that, that's a great question. Thank you, Michael. And I'm sorry to have gone a bit out of time. It's, you read the paper in very quick time. So uh, thanks for, for doing that. Uh, so, so essentially, I think the noise is probably important. Uh, over the, uh, the century or so that we're looking, essentially the, the, the signal is probably the first order, I would say. I think the, the, the noise is interesting. And we saw that, for instance, probably more in the COVID period, where what was perceived as quarreling of scientists was then interpreted as a sign that uh, this was not serious. And so I, I believe that it, that is something relevant. Uh, it's not something that we have modeled uh, directly, partly because it's a bit hard to evaluate what the noise is uh, over, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, there's not that much recorded of the debate. Um, so, so I think it's, this will be hard to cooperate, but I, I think it's an important one, uh, especially with the COVID uh, crisis in mind. Yeah, um, I'll yield to see, but I look forward to chatting in the, in the, in the um, top of the tops. Thank you all, uh, we're out of time. So I'll turn it to our MC Dr. Bandara today um, to uh, take us out, thank you. Um, so we are out of time. Um, however, if you have burning questions or thoughts for Jerome Adar, uh, you can join us for the Top of the Tops, uh, which is an interactive group discussion offered uh, immediately right after this, following the Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting uh, room URL post, uh, posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. Uh, we'll leave this webinar room open for about a minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is 
uh, bit.ly backslash tops meeting, all lowercase. Um, and thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. And finally, thank you to all of you, the audience of 165 people for your participation. Uh, have a top snatch weekend. Thank you all.